I would like to talk today, which is the World Cancer Day, about the achievements we have made in cancer medicine and research in the last 10 years, where we are and where we need to go. In regard to the achievements, I believe we have made three major ones. The first is that in the last five to eight years, we have been able to identify abnormalities in cancer cells that we are able now to target with the new drugs and kill the cancer cell. Now this is called targeted therapy and it is a new era because the drugs that we are producing are drugs that would target these abnormalities in the cancer cell and therefore the damage would be limited to the cancer cell only. Healthy cells will not be damaged. This is in contrast to traditional chemotherapy where drugs do not distinguish between a healthy cell and a cancer cell. In my opinion, this has been a major advancement. Examples of these drugs are like the use of Gleevec in chronic myelogenous leukemia, Herceptin in breast cancer, Crizotinib in lung cancer, and some of the new drugs we have recently developed for malignant melanoma. Now, the second major advancement is the delineation of the fact that a repeated infection in an organ may eventually lead to cancer. In my opinion, this is one of the most important concepts in modern cancer research that a repetitive infectious insult to an organ would eventually lead to cancer. This is important because this is a preventable process. In the early 70s, I described a disease in the small intestine whereby when children are exposed to repeated infections in the small bowel, a few years later, they developed a kind of cancer. Most recently, two Australian doctors proved that a bacteria in the stomach called H. pylori was able to produce cancer of the stomach. This relationship between infection and cancer is so important that the Nobel Prize Committee the year 2005 felt that the prize should go to these two Australian doctors who proved that an infection may eventually lead to cancer. And now the treatment of stomach cancer is by preventing this infection as early as possible with the use of antibiotics. Now the same thing holds true for viruses that attack the liver and if not treated eventually lead to liver cancer. Also it holds true for bladder cancer. For example in Egypt the most common cancer in Egypt is bladder cancer and it is caused by a microbe called schistosoma and if we prevent this infection we consequently prevent the occurrence of cancer. Now the ideal model of what we can do when we delineate the infectious cause of a cancer is to develop a vaccine and prevent the infection and consequently therefore prevent the cancer. A model is cervical cancer in women. Nowadays, we have a vaccine called the HPV vaccine 
that protects women against repeated infections with the human papilloma virus and consequently by preventing these infections we prevent squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. Nowadays we are able to prevent this kind of cancer by 75 percent. The remaining patients where we cannot prevent the cancer, we can detect the cancer early by pap smears and we can treat the cancer in the early phase and we can cure the bulk of all these patients. And therefore, in the year 2012, carcinoma of the cervix, which was an enormous enemy in the past, is now a very weak enemy. We can eliminate 90 to 95 percent of all of these cases. Now, the third major advancement was the discovery that a cancer cell might take 10 years in transformation from a normal cell to become a cancer cell. In this a process of deterioration from a healthy cell to a cancer cell, we can interfere therapeutically and reverse the process of neoplasia, meaning the process that would lead to the development of cancer and consequently prevent the cancer. A model of this concept is breast cancer in healthy women but who are at high risk for developing breast cancer in the future. Research has shown that if women who are at risk for developing breast cancer in the future by the fact that they have a strong family history or the fact that they are 60 years of age or more, if you take this woman and you treat them with simple drugs like Evista, which is a common drug used for the treatment of osteoporosis, or a drug called tamoxifen, or a drug called exemestane, which are the last two drugs are hormones. If you use these drugs in women who are at high risk, you can reduce the chances of, develop, of the development of cancer in this woman by 50%. And this is a, an important advancement. Now, we have made a lot of progress. Where do we need to go from here? I believe we have to spend more money in research on the relationship of infections and cancer. Because this is an area where it is very simple to abort completely and prevent the cancer. There are many diseases which are caused by repeated infections. We need to concentrate on these diseases, delineate the kind of infections that develop the cancer, and then treat these infections. We need to do research as to the best treatment for these infections so we can prevent the cancer. There has been little that has been done in the last five years in this area. We need to do far more. Also, there is an area which, in my opinion, is of extreme significance, and that is education. If we develop the best treatments for cancer, and we do not educate the public about early detection and the significance of uh, early detection and the significance of consulting physicians as soon as people develop symptoms, we will lose the, uh, the war against this disease. Education is probably one of the most important weapons we have. We do a lot of education in America, 
but I believe we should still do far more. There is another area which we need to work on, and that's how we can uh, put the knowledge that we have accumulated and that we have generated from research in the service of patients. Nowadays, that knowledge is rarely used in the service of patients. Uh, probably not more than 5 to 10 percent of cancer patients in America receive the best uh, treatment. There are three major obstacles to, 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 uh, and reasons for this. First are government rules that would, uh, uh, would take most of the time of the doctor doing a paperwork rather than taking actual care of patients. The second reason is insurance, that insurance policies interfere with early detection, interfere with the kind of diagnostic tests the doctor want to, wants to do on his patients, and interferes with the quality of medical care every day. We need to liberate the doctor in America from the tyranny of the government overregulation and the tyranny of insurance companies. The third reason is that we lack national health policies for the detection of cancer at an early stage. And we should do far more along this line. Thank you very much.